says, Blessed be the Holy One of Israel. Blessed be the God and Father of our Master, Yeshua the Messiah. Master of the universe, may it be your will that as we gather together in the precious name of your beloved Son, that he would be glorified in our words, in our teaching, in our midrash, in our fellowship together. Glorify your Son in this ministry, Father, and draw many from the east, the west, north, and south unto the love of King Messiah. Father, let the words of our mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable before you. Let this offering, this teaching be acceptable, O oh God. Cleanse us from all evil speech and all iniquity so that you may hear us and open our eyes to behold wonderful things in your Torah and empower us by the power of your spirit to walk circumspectly and to guard our words before you. Let it be acceptable before you, Father. Thank you. Anoint your speaker. Anoint those who would, who would hear and let fruit remain in time and eternity unto the honor of your beloved Son. Amen. Be Amen. Bless be Elohim. Beloved family, beloved friends, the powerful merit of Yeshua, we greet you again, thanking God for each and every one of you, precious saints of the Most High God. By God's grace, we want to share with you, if we will, on the theme our words, our spiritual sacrifices. Our words, our spiritual sacrifices. What about the sacrifices, can I ask? Why study the sacrifices? What can we, as disciples of Yeshua of Nazareth, learn about these sacrifices? Animal sacrifices, what relevance are they to me in 2021? What relevance? The book of Leviticus is not a, a best read among believers. It ought to be. In Hebrew, it's called Vayikra, and he called. But I submit to us, this book is part of all scripture. So go with me, please, to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 to 17. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 to 17. So um, sharing with us that Leviticus, in English, Vayikra in Hebrew, is part of the all scripture. So in 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, it says, all scripture, including Leviticus, inspired by Elohim and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man, the person of Elohim, may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So I believe the Spirit of God is telling us we need all scripture. And when the apostle penned those words, at that time, there were no Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what we call today the New Testament. So Timothy was nourished on the words of the prophets, the apostles, and the sages of Israel. And so you and I, seeing this today, forget that all scripture means all scripture, Genesis to Revelation. So and my point is that Leviticus is part of that all scripture. So you and I should benefit and we could be reproved, be corrected, be taught, so that we could be equipped and ready to do every good work by incorporating the reading of Vayikra, Leviticus into our reading. So whether we approve, whether we have revulsions at the thought of animal sacrifice, whether we think uh, they are superseded by the sacrifice of Jesus, whether we think that, that that is the old way of having sins forgiven by the blood of Jesus is the new way, whether we think that is irrelevant because God, the only wise God, has ordained the sacrifices. And so you and I should be more concerned about searching out the meanings and intentions of the sacrifices and see what God is communicating to us. So that's a big paradigm shift. That's a big dismantling of wrong paradigms so that we can embrace Leviticus as part of the all scripture of God. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 62 book of Isaiah chapter 62. And we want to deal with, with, with some of the hindrances, the obstacles that are clearly in our path. So in Isaiah chapter 62, verse 10, we have this. Isaiah 62, verse 10. Go through, says the Spirit of God. Go through the gates. Clear the way for the people, which means something is in our path. Build up, build up the highway. Remove the stones. Lift up the standard over the people. So there is a work to be done that involves clearing, going through, 
building up, removing obstacles. And that is happening in our mind. That is the work that needs to be done so that we can embrace Messiah, who is the embodiment of all scripture. And for us today, it's Genesis to Revelation. Go with me in the mouth of two or three, I think is established. So go with me for a second witness in Isaiah 57, verse 14. Isaiah 57, verse 14. We have this text revealed to us by the Ruach HaKodesh, by the Spirit of the Living God. And it will be said, build up, build up, prepare the way. That's a work to be done, right? That's construction language. That's building up language, right? Remove every obstacle out of the way of my people. So Isaiah, the prophet, is charged by God with a work. And that work continues today. Because in my mind and in your mind, there have been stones, obstacles that prevent us from understanding what the Spirit of God would want us to understand. What is Judaism's take on the sacrifices? Hear this quote. Why do we start the children with Le Leviticus and not with Genesis? So they're saying, why do we start to train our children to memorize Leviticus and not Je Genesis? So we imagine five years old, as a Jew, we memorize the book of Leviticus. This is the answer. The Holy One, blessed be he, said, since the children are pure and the sacrifices are pure, let the pure come and occupy themselves with things that are pure. So that's Judaism's take on the sacrifices. Now put that against some of Christianity's take on the sacrifices. And we see what God is saying to us. Now, you know, our master said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So since the sacrifices are pure, it means that we could see the personal work of God in studying the sacrificial system. But go with me to Titus, the book of Titus. We want to go to chapter 1, verse 15. Titus, chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. And we have this. Now, remember, I should tell you, the word sacrifice in Hebrew is karav, and it means to draw near. So we may think sacrifice means something that you have to do without, but in Hebrew, the sense of it is karav, draw near. So to sacrifice is to draw near to God. Oh, how different a mindset that is. Oh, how different an understanding that is. What sacrifices are God pleased with? A broken and contrite heart, because with such a heart, we draw near to God. Amen. So Titus chapter 1, verse 15 says, To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their mind and their conscience are defiled. They profess to know Elohim, but by their deeds they deny him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. So I submit to us, why do we not find ourselves wanting to gravitate to Leviticus? Is it possible that we are unbelieving? And our minds are defiled, so we don't gravitate to the sacrificial system. And we think we're being superior, being spiritual. But really, we are bereft of the spirit in understanding that to the pure, all things are pure. And since the sacrifices are pure, changing our mindset by studying the sacrifices, we come to understand what God wants. You see, in the sacrificial system, however, we get to give God what he asks for the way that he asks for it. It tells us that God must be worshiped in spirit and truth by the spirit and the truth of which he revealed that he's going to lead us by the spirit to walk out. Remember, the spirit is going to guide us into all truth. So imagine a, 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 a husband asks his wife, my dear, what do you want for our, an our anniversary? And she said, flowers. And in, in, in his mind, he says, no, I am uh, that flowers. That's going to be uh, uh, consumed and destroyed, will and die in a, a couple of days. I'm going to buy you a vacuum cleaner. And he goes out all proud thinking, okay, I'm going to get my wife a vacuum cleaner. I'll first you bring that home. And you already see what's played, playing out there. You already see that's not going to make for shalom by peace. That's going to make for contention. Because he is, he is bringing to his wife that which he thinks he needs. And the same thing happens with us. God says, I want flowers. And we come now with our vacuum cleaners. You see what's happening there, right? And so the sacrificial system is God's love language. Can I say that again? The sacrificial system is God's love language. We draw near to God on his terms, not on our terms. He tells us 
how to draw near. And that in itself should encourage us. You see, uh, thank you, Father. Genesis says, for this purpose, a man shall leave father and mother and cleave to his wife. Notice, it is a man has to cleave to the wife. For any man who wants his wife to cleave to him, we are reversing the roles. We are becoming a woman. And so the husband should cleave to the wife. So what God is saying, listen, husbands, you spend time with her rather than wanting her to spend time with you. You cleave to her. What she's doing, you go and get involved in doing that. That's the order. That's what, that, that, that's what God is saying to us. When we reverse the orders, we, we run into problems. But if we do things the way God is telling us to do it, Baruch Hashem. I'm learning that I am not uh, all fond of, of gardening, but that's something my wife loves. So to cleave to her, I have to avail myself and go and do some gardening. All right? And I know she would say a big amen and smile at that. But that's just a little example. We have to cleave to our wives. We have to go and engage in what they are doing rather than compel them to come and do what we're doing. We're reversing the role and we are being like a woman rather than like a man. May God help us. So again, the sacrificial system is about doing things God's way. Go and make the book of Romans, Romans chapter 13, Romans chapter 13, verse 4. Romans chapter 13, verse 4. Remember, all scripture is profitable for teaching and for correction. All right, so to, that we may have proper understanding. Romans 13, verse 4 has, uh, um, Romans 13, verse, oh, I'm sorry, Romans 10, verse 4. I'm saying 13, but it's, I'm sorry, Romans 10, verse 4. Please correct that. Romans 10, verse 4. That's the text that I want to go to. Romans 10, verse 4, not 13, verse 4. So Romans 10, verse 4 says, For Messiah is the end of the Torah for righteousness to everyone who believes. Romans 10, 4, Messiah, Christ, is the end of the law. And again, if we don't read the words the way the Spirit would have given to us, then we come with our preconceived notions and we come with our vacuum cleaner, thinking that we're all proud that we understand that Christ came to terminate the Torah. No, he didn't come to terminate the Torah. The word end there is teleos, from which you get the word telescope. It means Messiah is the goal to which the Torah points. Messiah is the goal, the end, not the end as in termination, but the end as in the goal to which the Torah points. So if you look through the Torah, you would see at uh, the view, King Messiah coming into focus. And that's what he's saying, not the termination, but the goal. The goal of doing the Torah is to become like the Messiah. That's why we study Torah. And since we have the spirit of Messiah, we're studying the Torah so we could see what we should do and how we should look like because it's a telescope, okay? We're seeing, and that same Torah would also function as a microscope. So we're gonna get a, a broad view, and we're gonna get the microscopic view. Blessed be God. And so these sacrifices should be seen not in a supersessionist replacement theology sense. I always talk about surpassing as opposed to superseding. Supersede is when you cancel, you think terminate, you think end. God is about surpassing the surpassing greatness of his excellency, the surpassing power, surpassing, surpassing, surpassing. That's what we're about. So Messiah didn't come to abolish, but to uphold the Torah. He came to bring about a reformation, a restoration, a, a restitution of Judaism. Can I say to us that Messiah is coming to give us a Yeshua-centric transformed Judaism? Messiah is about sharing with us a Yeshua-centric transform Judaism. So he's not coming to start a new religion. He's coming to transform, reform, to, 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 to conform us to the image of Messiah. And again, this is all part of us being corrected, right? So go with me to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 5, Luke chapter 5, verse 36, Luke chapter 5, verse 36 to 39, Luke chapter 5, verse 36 to 39. And we have our master giving us a parable. He gives us his parables because he, he, his message is the message of the kingdom. And remember, his mission is about raising up disciples. And he uses his parables to illustrate the message of the kingdom as he raises up disciples. So verse 36 tells us, and he was telling also them a parable. No one tears a piece of cloth from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. Otherwise, he will both tear the new and the piece from the new will not match the old. Verse 37, and no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins and it will be spilled out and the skins will be ruined. But the new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. And then he adds, 
and no one after drinking old wine immediately wishes for the new for he says the old is good enough the old is better and so this is what we could stumble over so we could stumble over errant theology and bad history by declaring that the new garment represents the gospel grace the new garment is the kingdom New garment is the church. The new garment is the new covenant, the, the new testament, the new spirit. So we're reading into the Bible rather than reading out, and we put our paradigm vacuum cleaner spin on it, and we don't see what Abba is wanting us to see. And we can say the old garment, well, that is the law. That's the Torah. That's Judaism. That's Israel. That's the old covenant. That's the old testament. That's works. That's how we view. That's how we have been taught. Sincere, but sincerely wrong. The implication of that, brethren, is that grace and law do not mix. That's the implication. So you find, why is it that, that believers don't find themselves wanting to read the Torah, more so Leviticus? Because in your mind, you're under grace, and that's old garment stuff. So why, why am I wearing old garment when I can have new garments? All right? So we go with that, and then we don't see that the, 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 uh, the new wine of, of Christ would burst out this old wine skin. So you can't do anything that looks like Torah. Because the Spirit of God wouldn't, can't, can't contain that. You know, he, he did away with that. He buried that. That's a, 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 a dead re, re, religion that he has to find a coffin and entomb it and done with that, right? We are in a new thing. Sincere, but sincerely wrong. All right? And so what the extreme of that thinking, brethren, is that we diminish the Jewishness of Jesus. We render the Torah obsolete. And we murder Jews. Because, you know, now we are seeking also to delegitimize the Jewish state. All of that comes in with the wrong teaching, wrong words that we speak. So we misinterpret Galatians and Hebrews because we have a wrong frame of reference. We are in error. We have not left Ur of the Chaldees. We feel we're in the promised land, but we haven't left Babylon yet. We're still in error. Ur of the Chaldees, we're still Ur in. Still deceived by spirit of error. So go with me, if you will, to Judges, Chapter uh, 15, the book of Judges. Going to and fro throughout the book, when we teach, we teach with the whole Bible because remember, all scripture is inspired. So we want to benefit from wherever the Spirit of God would give us insight from. So we're going now to the book of Judges, chapter 15, verse 45. Judges, chapter 15, verse 45. This is the account of Samson, right? And in that book, we have this Samson, remember, strong man Samson, verse 4. Samson went and caught 300 foxes and took torches and turned the foxes tail to tail and put one torch in the middle between the two tails. When he had set fire to the torches, he released the foxes into the standing grain of the Philistines, thus burning up both the, the shocks and the standing grain, along with the vineyards and groves. So we look at that account and what we see that Samson would have done, right? Gather these foxes, tie their tails, put a torch and send them loose. And they did what foxes do. They run because their tail on fire, right? And they just burn up everything. What does that have to do? Remember, all scripture is inspired. So what can we learn from that? Well, in Song of Songs, chapter 2, verse 15, we're not going to go there, but Song of Songs 2, 15 says, catch us the little foxes that, that ruined the vineyard. So God is teaching us something, right? We're putting them together. We saw what Samson did. We saw what is written in, in Song of Songs. And then I want you to go across now with me to James chapter 3. And you begin to see what, what the Spirit of God may, 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 may be telling us. In James chapter 3, from verse uh, 5 to 6. James chapter 3, verse 5 to 6. Let's now look at this. Remember, we're talking about foxes and fire, right? So, verse 5. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. See what, what Samson did, right? And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. So what would God want us to understand with the account of Samson? In the same way that those foxes destroy, those little things that are unguarded that comes out of our lips would destroy relationships and would destroy worlds. Catch us the little foxes, Father. Catch us the little foxes. You see, when you consider race replacement theology, it is a, a, an evil word that has spread. And replacement theology speaks against God, the faithfulness of God, 
against the Torah, against the Jewish people, and against the, the land of Israel. And that has spread like wildfire across the world. All right, but God is teaching us something here. Go back with me now to Exodus, back in the Torah. Exodus chapter 22, verse 6. Exodus 22, verse 6. God, open our eyes to behold wonderful things out of your Torah. Exodus 22, verse 6. So we read this in the Torah. God reads for us. If a fire breaks out and spread the torn bushes so that stacked grain or standing grain or the field itself is consumed, he who started the fire shall surely make restitution. You see what God is saying? He whoever started that fire will make restitution. Question. Who started this fire? Who started this fire? Because what we have here is a, in these wineskins is a, 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 an understanding what was called incompatibility interpretation. It's an it's a interpre interpretation that is anachronistic. And what, what does that mean? Anachronistic means a thing belonging to a period other than the one to which it exists. So when you put the spin that the old wine and the new wine and the old gums and new garment refers to Christianity and Judaism, law and grace, you're reading into the text and it is incompatible. It is error. It is wrong. But a fire has spread and has consumed most of Christianity. And precious few are coming to understand now the error. Oh my God, help us. And so as we begin to see it, I ask, who told you you were naked? Are you seeing where I'm going with this? Who lit the fire? I submit to us. Matthew 13, 20, it says, an enemy has done this. Matthew 13, 20, it says, an enemy has done this. An enemy, the father of lies, spoke. And unsuspecting disciples believed his words and run with it. And we are set our course, destroying what God expects us to benefit from. Who set the fire? So this morning, what we're doing is dismantling replacement theology. We are not dismantling Judaism because we're talking about transforming Judaism. That's the error. Jesus didn't come to dismantle Judaism. He came to transform, reform, conform it to the image of the Messiah. What we are dismantling is replacement theology because someone would have set that grain field on fire. It's a house of thoughts, a house of lies, and it must be destroyed. Go with me to Leviticus. Go with me to Leviticus, book of Le Le Leviticus chapter 14. Leviticus chapter 14. In this book, we learn about biblical leprosy, not Hansen disease, and we learn about leprous persons, leprous garments, and leprous houses. So we're going to look now at a leprous house. Uh, and verse four, chapter 14, verse 41 says this. So this is a priest coming to examine leprosy in a house. He shall have the house scraped all around inside, and they shall dump the plaster that they scrape off at an unclean place outside the city. That's if the priest comes and says that your house has leprosy. Then they shall take other stones and replace those stones, and he shall take other plaster and replaster the house. You see what God is saying? We have to replace replacement theology. We have to replace replacement theology. Replace those parts, those, those stones in the house of Christianity that would have become infected and has affected the whole house of belief. Verse 43, if, however, if the mark breaks out again, you know, you, you nip replacement theology in the body and it springs up because it's a tentacle. That is the warp and woof and it, it consumes. It spreads again, it breaks out again. You, you, you chop it down in one area and it, sprint, it springs up again. So it, the, the mark breaks out again in the house after it has been torn out of the stones and scraped the house and after it has been replastered. Verse 44, then the priest shall come and make an inspection and we see that the mark has indeed spread in the house. It is malignant mark, malignant, malignant, cancerous, yes. In the house, it is unclean. He shall therefore tear down the house. This is God's wisdom, tear down the house 
its timbers and all the plaster of the house, and he shall take them outside the city to an unclean place. So that is what God is saying that must be done. And so immediately we are recognizing, I'm bringing this teaching, and you're saying the all is better. The way how you see things, that's better. But I'm hopeful because the text says, no one immediately desires new wine because he says the old is better. In other words, at first there's resistance, there's reluctance, there's rationalization, but God eventually breaks through and we begin to see that we are in error. Go with me to 1 Kings chapter 12. 1 Kings chapter 12. God, you are helping us to see things in ways that we have not seen and please help us, oh God. Every plant that you have not planted, let it be uprooted. Lord, dismantle and destroy that aspect of Christianity that speaks about replacing Israel with the church and speaking Lash and Hara against you, against your scriptures, against your people, and against the land of Israel. Deliver us from that, Lord. Let us not be leprous along with that understanding. First, so 1 Kings chapter 12, I want to break in, into this thought. This is after Solomon would have died and his son Rehoboam would have ascended his throne. And now the, the, the people comes to Rehoboam and says, listen, Solomon would have put pressure on us. Please, you know, consider and lighten the burden. And let's, let's break into the thought with, with that. So verse 4, chapter 12, verse 4, your father made our yoke hard. Now therefore lighten the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke which he put on us. And we will serve you. Oh my God. Then he said, depart for three days, then return. So the people de uh, departed. King Rehoboam consulted with the elders who had served his father Solomon while he was still alive. Wonderful way to go. Saying, how do you counsel me to answer these people? Then they spoke to him saying, if you will be a servant to these people today and will serve them and grant them their petition and speak good words to them, then they will be your servant. But verse 8, oh my God. But he forsook the counsel of the elders which they had given him and consulted with the young men who grew up with him and served him. And he said to them, what counsel do you give that we may answer these people who have spoken to me saying, lighten the yoke? The young men who grew up with him spoke with him saying, thus are you say to these people, your father made our yoke heavy. Now you make it lighter for us, but we shall speak to you. My little finger is thicker than my father's loins. Whereas my father loaded you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father discipline you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. That's the advice that he gets from his young person. That's the advice he gets. Are you seeing what I'm saying? We're com contrasting now the younger and the elder. We're contrasting with the thinking where, okay, Christianity is younger and that is good. And we forsake everything with Judaism. That's all. We are in it now. And what you're doing is putting a heavier burden on the people that you are not even prepared to lift. Because you're consulting in your folly, youthful thinking. Christianity, who has now come on the scene, want to tell the Jewish people how to pray, how to interpret their own scriptures. Because we have grace, you see. We have the Spirit. And so we want to put a burden upon the Jewish people. Cast away your Torah. That's what we're saying to them. And it's ignorant. It's arrogance. It's folly of youth. Oh, God, save our youth from the Rehoboam syndrome. Save us from the Rehoboam syndrome, where we consult, consult our own self and not on the ancients of days who have been there all along and have all this wisdom. We consult with our own self because we have it. We're young. We have, we're in the go. It's the folly of youth. And may God deliver our youth from that. And of course, you know what would have happened, right? Verse 16, when all, all Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, the people answered the king, say, what portion do we have in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your God, to your tents, O Jacob. Now look after your own house, Israel. So Israel departed to their tents. In other words, it was the split of the kingdom. Are you seeing how ungodly counsel, youthfulness, folly, forsaken tradition, forsaken the Torah, you, you have a split? Are you seeing where, where, where you, that wrong mindset would have done? Israel is now split, the house of Judah and the house of Israel, because of wrong teaching, bad theology, and wrong words. No good words spoken. The split has come. The schism between Judah, Judaism and Christianity. Where does it come from? Christianity consulted with themselves. The younger consulted with themselves. And so now look what has happened. But I believe the prophets. A new covenant is coming with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And the church will see him, themselves incorporated into Israel rather than replacing and becoming a part of this blessed. So <laughs>